Welcome along, fellow Beatle people. As you know, I've written a bunch of books about the homes of the Beatles and other luminaries, especially books about Friar Park. And so this time around, I'm going to be reading excerpts from my book, Friar Park, A Pictorial History, which I put together in, God, let me look, 2014. Wow. So 10 years ago, as of the time of this recording. So some of you probably already have this book, and if so, you know, you know what a lot of the images are that are in here and some of the text that goes along with it, but not everybody has this book. And even if you do, you might want to hear some of this information. So I'll go through it and share some of this information with you. I'm going to do it probably part one and part two, possibly part one, two, and maybe even three. We'll see how far we can get in maybe about 20 minutes or so. Before I begin, please like, share, and subscribe to Beetle People on whatever platform you are listening on, especially if you're listening on YouTube. Now please join me around the campfire. Friar Park, a pictorial history. So the reason I put this book together, I was working on a really big book about Friar Park, and I had all these great photographs, and I thought, you know... It'd be cool just to show the photographs and add some captions. And so let's go with table of contents here. Got Henley on Thames, which I'm assuming not many of you are probably interested in. And then some information on the residence and then Friar Park, the lodges and the house. So why don't we just go ahead and focus on that at first. I'll read the introduction. Here we go. In a similar way to how the Dakota apartment building in New York City became famous around the world, because of its indelible association with John Lennon. The same can be said about Friar Park as a result of its association with Lennon's fellow Beatle, George Harrison. But there is so much more to know. As an investigative historian, I was already well-versed in the history and lore of Friar Park before knowing of its relationship to Mr. Harrison. And it is the information that I acquired at that time that I am sharing here. When I refer to Friar Park, I am concerned not just with the house itself, but also its themed gardens, which during the time of Sir Frank Crisp, were among the finest and most extravagant in England and around the world. Sir Frank Crisp was a whimsical, and some say eccentric, and visionary man who was on the forefront of an assortment of social and political issues and advancements. As a result, since the end of the 19th century, Friar Park has been a place of significant historical and social events, and has inspired various elements of architecture and landscape design many of which have been overshadowed by the private ownership and restoration of Friar Park by George Harrison in the latter half of the 20th century. Despite the fact that Friar Park has been inhabited by other residents, which includes Sir Percival David, the Salesian Sisters of St. John Bosco, and George Harrison, Friar Park, a pictorial history, shines a spotlight on Friar Park as it existed when it was inhabited by its ideator and original resident, Sir Frank Crisp. Welcome. To Friar Park. Alrighty, and then chapter one here, I focus on Henley on Thames. And so for those of you who don't know much about Henley, it says the following. The town of Henley is a beautiful medieval town that is situated on the north bank of the winding river Thames in Oxfordshire. In 1179, King Henry II bought land for the making of buildings, and by the 13th century its river port was active in trade. The name is a compound of hen, meaning old, and lay, meaning a place. The main streets form a cross, extending from the bridge through Hart Street, the marketplace, and up through Gravel Hill. Hart Street takes its name from an ancient inn at that location. And I have an 1826 illustration of Henley on Thames, an 1826 image of Henley Town Hall, and an 1826 image of Henley Bridge. And I've got images of postcards of downtown Henley in the 19th century, as well as an 1839 postcard of the Henley Regatta. And another postcard. All right, let's talk about the residence. So I've got a really cool image of Sir Frank Crisp, and the text is as follows. Sir Frank Crisp, 1843 to 1919, was a lawyer, microscopist, and philanthropist. He was the senior partner in Asher, Morris, Crisp, and Company, with offices at 17 Throg Morton Avenue in London. Crisp was knighted in 1907 and was created a baronet in 1913. His interests included horticulture, gardening, and natural history. He was the ideator of Friar Park's house, buildings, and landscape gardens. 
Sir Frank Crisp was president of the Horticultural Club, VP and treasurer of the Linnean Society of London, honorary secretary of the Royal Microscopic Society, and was a justice of the peace for Oxen. He was awarded the Victoria Medal of Honor in Horticulture by the Royal Horticultural Society. He spent much of his personal time in Henley, where he actively participated in town affairs. And then turning the page, I've got an image of some of his microscopes, and also a character of Sir Frank Crisp by Leslie Ward that was published in Vanity Fair on May 31st of 1890. And the text is as follows. Sir Frank Crisp was a well-respected office bearer of the Royal Microscopic Society and an enthusiastic collector of microscopes. He was recognized as a leading authority of their history and development. His private collection consisted of nearly 3,000 microscopes and over 1,000 pieces of apparatus. That's pretty cool. <laughs> you got to admit. I know a lot of people listening to this right now have all sorts of collections, mostly beetle stuff. But man, 3,000 microscopes? Good golly. Alrighty, and then we've got a pretty cool image of Sir Frank Crisp and his gardener. And they're holding what appears to be gigantic grapes. So I think it's difficult for me to read this caption without you seeing the image. So I'll go ahead and post this maybe on my Patreon so you can check that out. All right, turning the page, we're going over to Sir Percival David. And I've got an image of him, which was not easy to find, by the way. And the text is as follows. The second owner of Friar Park was Sir Percival Victor Ezekiel David, second baronet. He was born in Bombay on July 21st of 1892. He passed away on October 9th of 1964. His father was Sir Sassoon David, first baronet, and a founder of the Bank of India. Sir Percival was known as an important collector of Chinese porcelain. The Percival David Foundation of Chinese Art is a collection of Chinese ceramics and related items in London, England. The foundation's main purpose is to promote the study and teaching of Chinese art and culture. Sir Percival was, at one point, the Exhibition Committee Director of the International Exhibition of Chinese Art at the Royal Academy. In this rare photograph, he is seen inspecting an equally rare and quite valuable item. And then we move on to the Salesian Sisters of St. John Bosco. And the text is as follows. Following the divorce of Sir Percival David from his wife in 1953, Friar Park was acquired by the Salesian Sisters of St. John Bosco. Numerous nuns and at least one monk remained in residence throughout the 1950s and 1960s, until it was decided to put Friar Park up for sale at the end of 1969. And now the part you've all been waiting for. George Harrison. Beginning in the late 1960s, George Harrison and his wife, Patty Boyd, set upon the quest of finding a suitable home for them that would be set away from the road, offer more privacy, and would offer an opportunity for him to build his own recording studio. He was also hoping to have a water feature, such as a lake, on the property. During her valiant search, Patty Boyd spotted an advertisement in the Sunday Times, placed by the Salesian Sisters of St. John Bosco. Following her initial visit, she returned with George, when they made their offer, they were not aware of many of the whimsical wonders that were awaiting them, such as the stepping stones and water caves within the lakes. In January of 1970, George Harrison paid £140,000 for Friar Park, which included the lower and middle lodges and all building structures on the property, including glass houses and the house. Also included were 20 acres of lawn and land, as well as 12 acres of landscape gardens. Fans got sneak peeks of Friar Park's gardens and grounds in the music videos for Crackerbox Palace, Ding Dong Ding Dong, and True Love. Many of George Harrison's songs include lyrics taken from, or inspired by, carvings around the house and property, including Ballad of Sir Frankie Crisp, Ding Dong Ding Dong, and The Answers at the End. Following the purchase of Friar Park, George Harrison installed a 16-track tape-based recording studio, which was the headquarters for his company, Dark Horse Records. The home recording studio was known as F.P. Schott, Friar Park Studios, Henley on Thames, and was utilized by George Harrison and other recording artists under his label, such as Splinter. Alrighty, let's talk a little bit about Friar Park, shall we? We're on page 23. I've got a map here that was illustrated by Alan Tabor, and the text is as follows. In the early 19th century, Friar Park, as it is known today, 
consisted of various plots of land that included an estate on the west known as Friar Park and an estate on the east known as Friar's Field. They were separate and had their own driveways. Though Frank Crisp lived and worked in London, he desired to build a country house in Henley. So, he purchased the estates and lands, demolished the house to the east, where the lake is now located, and built a large house and other buildings that are on the property today. The selective colorization in the following image shows the winding driveway, beginning from the lower entry gates as it climbs northwest, overlooking the spacious gardens, lakes and grounds, past a varied collection of trees, shrubs, and flowers, and arriving at the semicircular carriage sweep by the south entrance of the house. I actually have the physical book in front of me right now so you can hear me actually turning the pages. So I highly recommend, if you're going to buy my book, get the actual paper edition. And then on page 24 is an engraving of the mansion at Friar Park before it was built. And the text is as follows. This engraving of Friar Park's house and terrace garden was completed during the design stage before construction began. It is not known if there was ever a glass house to the north of the house. If so, it was clearly removed after a short while, as was typical of Frank Crisp, who never hesitated to tear down any garden or structure until he was satisfied with the final results. And then on page 25, I have an interesting postcard, and the text is as follows. Because Friar Park was considered to be an attraction for those interested in horticulture and landscape design, Frank Crisp allowed the grounds and gardens of Friar Park to be open to visitors one day each week. The charge for each person was, at the time, a sixpence. Crisp divided the proceeds between the Gardener's Royal Benevolent Institution, the Royal Gardener's Orphan Fund, and the Mayor of Henley's Convalescent Fund, which benefited local charities. Between 1898 and 1913, it was estimated that more than 100,000 visitors enjoyed the grounds of Friar Park. That's pretty impressive. I don't know how many people have been to your home, but chances are it's not been 100,000. All right, let's see how much more we could accomplish here. I can talk about the Lower Lodge, the Middle Lodge, and the Upper Lodge and maybe even the garden offices, and then we'll do the rest in the next episode. Okay, Lower Lodge. Once again, this is a pictorial history, and so there are images in the book that I can see, and I'm reading the text to you that's underneath the images. So, under the first one, it's as follows. The main entry to Friar Park is a gateway set back off Gravel Hill. It is flanked by two sets of ornamental gate piers supporting heavy central iron gates, and flanking equally ornamental pedestrian gates. The red brick and stone banded piers support friar's heads and iron lamps. Beyond the gate, on the northwest side of the driveway, there is a flamboyant two-story gothic style lodge of brick and stone. Legend has it that the lower lodge was built and rebuilt until it met the high expectations of Frank Crisp. Upon completion, the lower lodge was occupied by Mr. Philip O. Knowles, while he was in the position of being Frank Crisp's steward and gardener. At the time of its construction, in the late 19th century, the expenditure, at the time, was roughly 3,000 pounds. All right, let's talk about the Middle Lodge. Got a pretty cool photo of that. And the text is as follows. The Middle Lodge is located within a brick and railed wall that runs along Gravel Hill, along the south boundary of Friar Park, just a short walk or drive west of the Lower Lodge. This one-and-a-half-story structure was designed in a similar style to the other lodges, with red brick and stone dressings, and includes a tile roof, gables, and an elaborate square bay window made of stone. The gargoyle at the peak of the roof overlooks the brick and stone banded piers and iron gates that lead to Gravel Hill, as well as the private path that joins the winding driveway that leads to the house. Over the course of time, it has housed many residents, including musicians who recorded at George Harrison's home recording studio. And that would include the guys from Splinter, and even Klaus Vorman stayed there for a while. All right, let's talk about the Upper Lodge. Got a cool photo of that as well, and the text is as follows. On the northwest corner of Friar Park is the Upper Lodge, and its associated horse stables. It is accessed from Gravel Hill through red brick entrance walls, 
iron gates, and decorative piers. It is designed in a similar Gothic style as other structures on the property. The exterior is adorned with red bricks, tiles, and a turret with a pyramidal roof, stone mullions and transoms. An ornamental finial in the design of a dragon sits atop the roof of the south side gable. The interior of this two-story building is accessed through an arched stone doorway with the detailing of heraldic animals and the following inscription that translates to high but not haughty. During the time of Sir Percival David, the upper lodge was occupied by Mr. Christopher Brown. Following their divorce, Sir Percival David's wife, Lady David, moved into the upper lodge while the rest of the property was put up for sale. All right, let's talk about the garden offices. We're on page 33, the text is as follows. To the west of the house, near the glass houses, and what was once the fruit and berry garden, stands the garden offices. The clock in the tower has the signs of the zodiac in the place of the usual figures. On the tower itself, and the adjoining wings are various inscriptions. As mentioned by Crisp, quote, The points of the compass are not indicated on the wind vane at the top of the tower, by the usual letters, but by Adam, A-D-A-M, these being the initials of the four Greek words, which denote the cardinal points, E-W-N-S, and these were understood to prove that God created Adam out of dust, which has been collected from the rising and from the setting of the sun, from the north and from the south. Now, I was going to end this particular episode on that, but I think I'll go ahead and just very briefly talk about the house and then we'll pick up on this in the next episode. So I have a really cool image of the mansion of Friar Park and surrounding property that was taken probably in the late 30s. And here's the text. It is estimated that by 1889, Frank Crisp had acquired 62 acres for his country retreat. Once done, he hired architect M. Clark Edwards to assist in designing the Victorian Neo-Gothic house and other buildings on the property. Crisp then went about landscaping the land with informal lawns, mature trees, newly planted horticultural specimens, paths, lakes, water features, and elaborate gardens. By the time Friar Park was purchased by George Harrison, there remained just over 30 acres, which included 10 to 12 acres of formal gardens that were overwhelmed with neglect. George Harrison and his friends from the Hare Krishna movement took on the task of clearing the weeds and bringing the landscape gardens back to their former glory. And so this concludes this episode of the Beetle People podcast, where I'm reading from my book, Friar Park, A Pictorial History. I'll go ahead and read a lot more and maybe even the rest in the next episode. So what do you think about Friar Park? If you were rolling in dough, would you live in a place like that? You know I would. Please like and share and subscribe to the show on whatever platform you are listening on. Until next time, I wish you safe travels on all your journeys.